Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity of uh, studying your word, and I pray that the Holy Spirit will speak now as, um, as I share the things that I believe you've put on my heart. So please tailor make it so that it will be meaningful and that it will make a difference in our lives. This is my prayer. In Christ's name, amen. In uh, 2010, BBC, they, they notified, or they, they actually, they wrote of a survey done by Ask Jeeves. Ask Jeeves is, um, is a search engine on the internet. And they had done a survey where no less than 1.1 billion people had participated. Now that's quite a lot of people. Uh, and that was, it was done through 10 years, and they had asked one question to these 1.1 billion people. And that was, which question is the most unanswerable question in the world? And on the top 10 list of this uh, were questions like, um, uh, is there a God, obviously? Another one was, um, and did the Tony Soprano die? Do blondes have more fun? Um, weird questions, maybe, that came up for the top 10 unanswerable questions. But other, other questions also was, which is the best diet? And um, lots of these things. But which, which question do you think was the, was the top question? Any guesses? Of the most unanswerable question in the world, according to these 1.1 billion people. Any guesses? What is happiness? Good question. Not, not that one. What is truth? No, it wasn't that one. Yeah? Why am I here? It's close to it. <laughs> but, um, yeah, God is exists was one of them, but it wasn't the top one. What is my purpose? What is the meaning of life? That was the number one. What is the meaning of life? Now, so that's the most unanswerable question according to these 1.1 billion people. And think about it for yourself. What would you ask if somebody, somebody uh, what would you say if somebody asked you that question? What is the meaning of life? I think even as Christians, we have sometimes a difficulty in answering this question. And I'd like to put this question to you. Uh, if you if you got a microphone in your, in your face and a person asked, what is the meaning of life? What would you say? Any, any thoughts? What would, you, what would you say? What's the meaning of the ultimate meaning of life? Okay. To give glory to God. Thank you. Okay. Something else? To know God. All right. And any other? What would you say? To spread happiness. Amen. Uh, any other thoughts? What's the ultimate meaning of life? Would you all say the same? <laughs> Pardon? Let other people live. Okay. Mm-hmm. Wonderful, yeah? So you would say that? To know God, to have salvation, maybe get to heaven? Right, right. Yeah, uh, and I ask this in many churches, and, and always I get different answers. <laughs> it's quite, quite funny in one way. Um, none of these answers are necessarily wrong. And um, I think many of them are very close to what I believe the Bible says, uh, in regards to this, but I don't want to give you my own opinion about it. I'd like to, stu to study today uh, the ultimate meaning of life. And um, I was actually a bit amazed when I found what the Bible says, because I had to really change my mind on, on this topic. So I'd like to, to there was a, a very wise person that lived about 3,000 years ago, and he diligently sought the meaning of life. And uh, what was his name, do you think? Solomon, that was his name. Solomon, he searched all the philosophies, he searched all of the uh, wise sayings of people, and he tried to find out what is the ultimate meaning of life, and then he wrote a book about it, and that's called Ecclesiastes. 
So if you turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes, it's right, well, after Psalms you have Proverbs, and then Proverbs, after Proverbs comes Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, and um, we will read in verse 15. This was his conclusion, and I'll read from the ESV here. His, he, he tried to discover the underlying meaning of life. And his discovery was maybe a bit radical. He discovered, or at least according to him, the ultimate purpose of life is, lo and behold, to be happy. Look at it in, in Ecclesiastes 8, 15. I'm reading from the ESV. It says, And I commend joy. For man has no good thing under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful. That was his conclusion. And we might think no better thing to do than to be joyful. Is that really, is that really the case? But this was not a conclusion he was alone in having. Uh, Isaiah, if we go to Isaiah chapter 65, we'll find the exact same thing. Isaiah 65 and verse 18. It says, For behold, I create, Jeru uh, I, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever. Sorry, I read verse 17 also. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing and her people a joy. What did, what did he create us for? He created us to be a joy. To be joy. And if we are a joy, are we joyful, you think? I believe so. Now, this is quite radical, I understand this, but I believe that you will agree with me as we, go, as we proceed. The underlying meaning of every person's existence is to be happy. And unless you think that's only the Old Testament, let's go to the New Testament and find some other text. Romans chapter 14 and verse 17. Romans chapter 14 and verse 17. Romans chapter 14 and verse 17. It says there, Romans 14 verse 17, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and what? And joy in the Holy Spirit. Now what do you think it means when, when Paul is saying that the, the kingdom of God is not eat, eating and drinking, but these kinds of things? I believe what he's saying is that the, the nucleus, the core, the very fundamental there of the kingdom of God is actually these kinds of things. Peace and righteousness and joy. So we have joy as the ultimate foundation of the kingdom of God. Now go to... First, First Thessalonians chapter five. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse sixteen through eighteen. First Thessalonians five, verse sixteen through eighteen. The Bible says. Rejoice, how often? Evermore. Mine says always. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So is it God's will for us to be happy? Is it his plan for us to be happy? How often does he want us to be happy? 
If he had his will, he wants, us, he wants us to be happy every day, always. This is amazing. So both the Old and the New Testament agree on this basic fact that the will for God in your, the will for, for your life, uh, the will of God for your life is to be happy. And I would say that every other answer that we have given here is um, ultimately it, um, the foundation of them comes to the, down to the same point. Because imagine with me, let's go through some of these. <coughs> some people say to do to be a good person that's the meaning of life you know to to do the right thing and we might say oh that that's of course meaningful to to be a good person isn't it we should not be bad people should we that's not god's ideal but the question i want to dig i want to dig deep why should we be a good person oh somebody says well god commanded it he said uh, you in his commandments it says you shall not do this and you shall not do that all right but why did God command it? Why was it just a means in and of itself? Why does God want us to keep his commandments? Some Christians, they think that feelings are sinful. And uh, then they resist them, they turn them off. They grit their teeth and they do what's right because it is right. And they are mi live a miserable Christian life. This is not God's ideal for our lives. Now, of course, the Bible speaks about self-sacrifice and that we need to deny ourselves, as we talked in the Sabbath school today about. But if that is what it means, then the Bible would be contradictory. Someone might say that, you know, it was in, eight, in 1982 when I almost smiled, but I managed to contain myself. Is that God's purpose for our life? Imagine, if we take away joy from, from this equation, is it meaningful? Is, it, is there any meaning to obeying God's commandment? Well, if God is just looking for people to do a round of ceremonies for him, he would have created robots, wouldn't he? he, he, he wouldn't, there wouldn't be a purpose. It is not a means in and of itself. That's what I want to, to venture to say. Keeping the commandments is not a means in and of itself. Or is not an end in and of itself, sorry. It is the means to an end. Must forgive my, my English. It is not the end, but it is the means to another end, which is joy. Let's go to Psalms 19. Psalms 19 and verse 8. Psalms 19 and verse 8. It says there, Psalm 19 and verse 8, The statutes of the Lord are right. Now, many of us would say amen to that, and I would say amen to that as well. The statutes of the Lord are right. But then what does it say? Rejoicing the heart. So what's the purpose of the commandments? It's to rejoice our heart. We'll, we'll talk more about this. But I think if you look at any of these descriptions, you will find that happiness lies at the foundation of all of them. What about going to heaven? All right, the ultimate meaning of life is to get to heaven, you know? Uh, but why should we go to heaven? Would it be meaningful to live forever, to have eternal life if there was no joy? Would you want to go to a place where there was no joy for all eternity? I would not want to go there. See, if you take joy out of the equation, everything just collapses in and of itself. Uh, Isaiah 35 and 10 says, The ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with, e with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. You know, the ultimate meaning, the, the ultimate purpose of, of God bringing us to heaven is so that we, because there in heaven, there is more joy than there is down here on earth. There's infinitely greater joy there. So joy is at the foundation of God wanting to bring us to heaven. 
Uh, someone might say, well, the meaning of life is to do evangelism, to do service. Now, there are few things that I find more meaningful in life than to serve others, to reach out to people, to, to help them to, to realize uh, the truth of the Bible. Um, and it is, it is a meaningful thing. However, if you want to dig deeper, what is the underlying meaning of that? What is the underlying purpose of, of uh, doing evangelism? Let's go to John chapter 4 and verse 36. John thir- chapter 4 and verse 36. Jesus is speaking. It says, And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may what? Rejoice together. Now, so what's the purpose of evangelism? (laughs) It's to rejoice. I mean, imagine with me if, if you take joy out of it. And, and you do evangelism as a duty, and, and you're, n- you're not happy, and you go out there and you say, come and become a Christian, we are never happy. Would that work? <laughs> evangelism would collapse. The, peop- the reason why we reach out to people is because they don't have the joy that Jesus Christ can give them. They don't have the joy that we have experienced in our lives, hopefully. And if we don't, haven't experienced this joy in our lives, uh, the, the reason of, of, of sharing that joy with others is... Is non-meaningful. Does it make sense? So I believe that the purpose for AFCO here is to train us to go out so that we can reach others to make them happier and to make God happier. And we ourselves will become happier. So you see, the joy is the foundation of, of it all. What about having a relationship with Jesus? We mentioned here knowing God, and I think this is very close to, to the, the ultimate meaning, the purpose of, uh, of our lives. But I would like us to look at First John chapter 1 just to see why Jesus wants us to have a relationship with him. You know, having a relationship in and of itself is that, is that the ultimate end. You know, you can have different relationships, can't you, with someone. Just having a relationship in and of itself doesn't make it necessarily the the ultimate meaning. But if we go to 1 John chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, it says this. 1 John chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. Here we have the fellowship with the Son and with the Father. That is the relationship with God, isn't it? But notice verse 4. Why why does he say this? Verse 4, And these things we have written to you that your joy may be full. So why does Jesus want us to have a relationship with him? Is it just in order to have a relationship with him? Or is it actually that this relationship will bring joy? I believe it is because it will actually bring greater joy than any other relationship can ever give. And that is the ultimate foundation of having a relationship with him. Now, somebody here and here might think, oh, but Jonathan, it's a bit extreme. This sounds like hedonism to me. This sounds like, you know, um, this, you know what hedonism is? Like live for pleasure, live for the moment, just do whatever feels good, uh, this kind of mentality. Is that what the Bible is teaching? Is that what you're saying? No. You know, I believe that the, the devil has um, uh, a counterfeit to the true uh, the true uh, meaning of life. And I think hedonism is one of them. But turn to Job chapter 20 with me. Because I, I would actually venture so far as to say that actually the underlying philosophy of hedonism is not necessarily false. Because the underlying philosophy of hedonism says that the meaning of your life is to be happy. And that's what we've seen from the Bible, in that sense. The problem with hedonism 
is that the way in which they try to achieve this happiness does not work. That is the problem. So the underlying philosophy that, yeah, we're supposed to be happy, we're supposed to, to reach that which will make us happier, most happy, that's not wrong, but the problem is that it doesn't work if we do it through some other way. Job chapter 20 and verse 4 to 5 says, I'm reading from the NIV, Surely you know how it has been from old, ever since mankind was placed on earth, that the mirth of the wicked is brief, that the joy of the godless lasts but a moment. Is it not true? There's no lasting joy in hedonism. Sure, there might be some fun that you have, you know, but it's not going to give you that ultimate thing that we all seek for. Many seek joy in alcohol. They seek it in drugs. They seek it in pleasure, in entertainment, in music, in relationships, and uh, in money. But there was another person that did that, and that was Solomon. He had it all. He had everything you could ever wish for. He even had a thousand wives, okay? I don't recommend that. But, you know, he had lots of relationships. He had all the gold and the money that he could ever want. And you know what he said in the end? It's just a chasing after wind. He said, I got depressed I, I, I did not receive that joy that I was looking for. I did not receive that, that uh, fulfillment that my heart was longing for. He needed something great. In my own personal testimony, I, I used to believe that the meaning of life is music and entertainment and computer games. And I was sitting there, my, I was playing my computer games, and I thought, this is actually this is the, the funnest thing in the world, and this is so great, you know? And I was sitting there, and I was playing on the computer and, and, and so on, but at times, the Lord really, you know, spoke to me, and, and I, re I felt this emptiness. I was like thinking, uh, I was thinking that if I could just get my hands on this newest computer game, then my life would be happy. Then I would be truly happy. And I found this computer game, and I played it, and it was so fun, and then, and then afterwards... I felt, oh, was this it? Is, is this everything there is to life? Am I actually supposed to, you know, go to school so I can get an education, so I can work, so I can get money, so that I can play computer games? I was just thinking, is, is this actually the ultimate enjoyment, enjoyment in my life? And I was saying, no, it can't be. There must be something more to it. And you know what the devil does? Well, he says, oh, Jonathan, you need more computer games. You need the one with better graphics. You need the one with a, that's more fun. And then I thought, okay, I'm, I'm going to try that one then. And it's a chasing after wind, my friends. You're never going to catch it. You're never going to get that joy that your heart longs for. And that's the problem with hedonism. The purpose of the whole great controversy, why did Jesus come and die on the cross? Well, he, he did it to save us. But the purpose is to prove whose path leads to joy, you know? Wh why, why, did, why, did, um, why did God allow Satan to continue for some time? It was to prove to the universe that his ways do not lead to joy. But that God's ways leads to joy. So the question is, how do we then find joy? Let's go to, back to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And verse 13. This is the conclusion about how to find joy. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13. It says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Are you ready for it? Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is all is man's all. Fear God and keep his commandments. Was that the best you could do, Solomon, after searching everything? To keep God's commandments? Is that what you what brought you joy? Now first the, our first initial reaction, at least to me, the before my conversion, I was see I saw that. Um, the commandments, it was something that restricted my liberty, you know. Oh, that means I can't do that and I can't do that. I can't be happy if I'm going to keep the commandments. Only till I realized what a blessing God put in the commandments. That he actually did it 
in order to give me happiness and not uh, the other way around. Let's go to, to John. Um, John chapter 15. John chapter 15, verse 10 through 11. Here's Jesus' conclusion of, of the commandments. He says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Now, okay, we ought to keep the commandments. That's what Jesus wanted, right? But look, look at verse 11. What does he say? These things I have spoken to you, why? That my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be what? Full. Now, if, if, if our joy is full, are we joyful? I believe so. You know, how many would like full joy? Like the most joy you could ever imagine. That's what God is, Jesus is telling us, keep my commandments. Uh, of course, Jesus, is, the relationship with Jesus is the, the is the first, the only thing that can help us to do that. Uh, but Jesus is, is explaining the purpose of the commandments. The commandments is not, it is the path to joy. It is not a condition for joy. I'll, I'll say that again. It is the, the commandments, the Ten Commandments that God has given is the path to joy. It is not a condition for joy in that sense. Um, what do I mean with that? Well, the, a condition, you know, as, as, uh, as young, um, as uh, kids, our parents gave us conditions, you know. Go clean your room and go make your bed and do the dishes and then you can have ice cream, right? That's condition. Right? You need to do these things first and then you will get this joy, this ice cream, all right? And... Uh, that is not how God's commandments work. It is the path to joy. It, you, can, you can think of the commandments as, as God's instruction on how to eat ice cream. <laughs> Does that make sense? It is God's, you know, you, if you read the commandments, it's like it says that, oh, you stick your tongue out, you, you, you lick on the ice cream, and then it'll taste good. And then when we think of it in that way, then we understand, aha, if I, I, that's his instruction of how I ought to eat ice cream. And Satan, he steps in and he says, no, 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 this is not how you eat ice cream. You know, uh, you, you take the paper of the ice cream and that's what you eat. And uh, no, you, you throw away the ice cream, you stand on the pavement and you, you lick the pavement and then it will taste good and you might find some little sugary gum there to lick. And, and people are doing that and God is coming saying, no, stop doing that, that's going to destroy your life. Uh, you, you're going to get sick if you, go, if you lick the pavement. And, and Satan comes and says, look at that mean God, he's just trying to keep all the joy away from your life. And millions of people are standing there licking the pavement wondering, why do I not feel happy? If we could just view the commandments in this light, it would make the whole world of difference. We would praise God for it. We would say, wow, thank you, Lord. You've been given me instructions about how to be happy. I mean, imagine if everybody kept the Ten Commandments. Wouldn't that be a happier world? Wouldn't it? No, no, we wouldn't have to have any locks on the doors. We wouldn't have any... Uh, no destroyed families. Everything would be so much greater if people kept the commandments. And so my challenge today to all of us is to see, to taste and see that the Lord is good. One author put it this way, It is a mistake to entertain the thought that God is pleased to see his children suffer. All heaven is interested in the happiness of man. Our heavenly Father does not close the avenues of joy to any of his creatures. The divine requirements call upon us to shun those indulgences that would bring suffering and disappointment, that would close to us the door of happiness and heaven. He requires us, only to perform, he requires us to perform only those duties that will lead our steps to heights of bliss to which the disobedience can never attain. Did you catch that? The purpose of, of everything, that he is, is giving us these commandments. The, the reason why he says we can't do this or can't do that is because those things take away joy from our life. They destroy this joy that God wants us to give. In Psalms 34 and verse 8. Psalms 
we read the scripture verse. It says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trust, trusts in him. And I think that includes also the woman. Anyone that would dare to trust God, that he actually has the best. He has, he has the greatest joy in mind for you. God wants to make us happy. But the only question that remains for us to answer is will we trust that he will make us happy? And that, my friend, that decision I cannot make for you. Each person needs to themselves make the decision to trust God. That yes, I believe that your plan is what will give me the greatest joy. I believe that your plan for me is, I, I've tried it other ways perhaps, but it hasn't really succeeded. But I trust that you are the one who can give me true joy and pure joy. Is there any person in here that would like to say, yes, Lord, I would like to trust you. I would want to decide to trust that you have my pleasure, my joy in mind. Is there one who would like to make that decision today? Praise God. Praise God. Heavenly Father, you see our decision. Lord, we, dare, we decide to trust you. Please guide us according to your plans. Help us to surrender our own wills. Where we think that we know what will make us happy. We don't know what will make us happy. But you know what will make us happy. So I thank you for your mercy, for your love, for the joy that you have prepared for us. And I pray that we may be filled with that joy. That we may experience that joy. And that we may be able to share that joy with others. Because ultimately, this is what every heart longs for. So we pray that you will come quickly and that you will make an end to the suffering that sin is causing. That we may have the joyful abode in heaven forever. This is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.